Good morning. So good to have each one of you with us today. As already mentioned a couple of times, if you're visiting with us, we are encouraged by your presence. We want you to feel welcome here, and we invite you to come back and worship with us anytime that you have the opportunity to do so. Before we get into our lesson this morning, I'd like to ask you to keep a very special lady in your prayers at this time. I don't know that there's anyone here other than myself that uh, knows this lady. Sister Marilyn Ellis, uh, she was a longtime dorm mother at Crowley's Ridge College. Had a lot of influence on a lot of different people. Uh, she was one of these people that everyone, everyone uh, fell in love with, and she really became, uh, she basically became our mother uh, when we were there. In fact, most of us still refer to her as Mama Ellis. Um, but Sister Ellis uh, has suffered a stroke, and she is in St. Bernard's. Uh, she's doing okay, uh, but she still has a, a long way to go. And so if you would, please remember Marilyn Ellis in your prayers at this time. The Gospel of Luke has some very unique traits. It introduces us to some different parables that we don't find in the other Gospels. It stresses to us that the blessed Gospel is for all, for Jews, for Gentiles, for outcasts, for Samaritans, for prodigals. It's the most comprehensive of the four Gospels. It shows us how Jesus has the ability to transform, excuse me, to transform our society. It stresses to us the working of the Holy Spirit and prayer. And about 20 times in this gospel, it stresses the subject of joy. Joy and rejoicing. It has been said that joy is not easy to describe to those who only know happiness. For happiness is the good feeling that you get when you have what you want. Happiness is that which is short-lived and leaves when your circumstances change. There is no secret to possessing joy. The Bible reveals that joy is a fruit of the Spirit of God. In other words, the results of God's Spirit working in our lives is that we will be joyous people. And that as we grow in our faithfulness, as we grow in our devotion to the will of God, and as those fruits of the Spirit uh, come to exemplify our life, they radiate forth in the things that we do, then we will become more joyous in our service to God. So we see that joy is not something that comes by accident. Joy is something that comes by obedience to God. This morning I would like for us to look at the Gospel of Luke. And I want us to see some of the reasons for rejoicing. The things that produce joy in the lives of children of God as set forth for us in this Gospel. Well first we rejoice because God hears our prayers. This was the case with Zacharias, as Brother Ed shared with us in the scripture reading just a few minutes ago. In Luke chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, it says, But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. Now to give you a little background of what was taking place here, Zacharias was fulfilling his priestly duties. He was there in the temple performing the tasks that were at his charge at this time and he was praying. He was praying in public on behalf of his nation. And I'm sure that part of the things that he was saying in that prayer was that he was asking God for the redemption of his nation asking God to provide a way to be set free from the bonds of sin, something that the Jews had been yearning for through the Messiah for centuries at this point. 
Well, we find that that prayer was going to be answered. But that prayer was going to be answered along with the answer to another prayer. Verse 7 tells us that Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth were at an advanced age. Simply put, it would take divine intervention for them to be able to conceive a child. And surely Zacharias and Elizabeth had prayed to God many times asking for children, asking to be allowed to bear children. But up to this point, that had not come to fruition. But now we see that two of the requests of Zacharias are about to come to fruition. They are about to take place in the birth first of John the Baptist. The forerunner of the Messiah. The one that was coming to prepare the hearts and the minds of the Jews to accept Christ as this promised Messiah. But we also see that the answer to his prayer for the redemption of his people was also going to come. And it was going to come through the birth of Christ. It was going to come through this Messiah. And so we see that God was in tune to the things that Zacharias was saying. He was hearing the words of those prayers. And he was going to answer those prayers in due time. When the time was proper for those prayers to be answered. And he was going to answer those prayers in the way that was most fitting for the situation. Now how long had Zacharias and Elizabeth prayed to have a child? We don't know. But probably for many years at this point. Probably for decades. But what we see is they were persistent. They continued to pray. They continued to be patient. Waiting on the Lord to answer the prayers that they offered. Well, Jesus urges us in Luke 18 and verse 7 that we are to be patient and persistent in, our, persistent in our prayers as well. And so the first reason that we have for rejoicing, we rejoice because God hears our prayers. We rejoice because as faithful Christians, we have the promise that God is going to hear. Now keep in mind, Just because God hears our prayers does not mean he's going to answer it the way we think he should answer it. Sometimes the way that God answers the prayers that he hears is with no. Many times he does say yes. Many times he does grant the requests that we make. But also sometimes, like with Zacharias, we have to wait a little while. We have to be patient because God knows what's best for us. God knows something that I've asked people to do from time to time. I don't know that I've ever done it here at Pyburn Street. But sometime I want you to just stop for a few minutes and think what your life would be like today if God had said yes to every request that you've ever made in prayer. What would your life be like today? We probably wouldn't like it very much. Because we don't always know what we need. But God does. And God answers our prayers in the way that's going to be the greatest blessing to us. The most beneficial to us. Secondly, we rejoice because God uses ordinary people just like you and me to promote his will. This is what God did in his choosing of Mary. You know, there was nothing special about Mary. She was just a common Jewish woman. Nothing special, no signs of greatness about her whatsoever. In fact, if we look at Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 48, and what's commonly referred to as the song of Mary, we see this sentiment being set forth. Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my Savior. For he hath regarded the low estate. Meaning she she recognized that there was nothing special about her. Recognized the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. So notice in this, we see her making the statement that there's great joy in what has come to her. 
There is reverence toward God. She is accepting the task that has been placed upon her. She's grateful that God looked at her. And even though she saw nothing special about herself, she was a humble person. God bestowed this this honor upon her. But notice that she also makes the proclamation that as a result of this, as a result of the task that God has given to her, that all generations would call her blessed. And certainly that's a true statement, isn't it? All generations do think of Mary as being blessed for what she was allowed to do. She was the one that was allowed to give birth to the Messiah. She was the one that was there with him that raised him. She played a very important role in his life. She realized the importance of the task before her. And even though she was just a common person. Folks, she was just like you and I. Just a common person. God used her to promote his will. God used her to further his cause. We look throughout the New Testament. Look at the ones that were chosen to be apostles. Who were the ones that were chosen? Were they the religious elite? No. Were they the the wealthy, high-ranking people in society? No. They were common people. Common, hard-working, humble people. But they were being used to accomplish great things for the cause of Christ. And the same thing rings true today. Common people are doing so many great things for the cause of Christ. And we rejoice as those common people. We rejoice that God is able to use us, to use you and I, to further His cause. We rejoice for that fact. Also, we rejoice because God has provided us with a Savior. Imagine what it would have been like living under the law of Moses without the Savior. Without the hope that Jesus has brought to us. Knowing that our sins are still binding upon us. And yes, through faith we know that in the future a Messiah is going to come. But we don't know when that's going to be. I I couldn't imagine living under that system. But we rejoice today that we don't live that way. We rejoice today in the fact that God sent His Son. We rejoice that we have a Savior, that we are no longer bound to sin, that we've been set free and we have the hope of heaven. We rejoice that we have a Savior. And that's the good news, isn't it, that the angels proclaimed to the shepherds on the night of Jesus' birth in Luke 2, verses 10 and 11. Where the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. That good news was that that long-awaited Savior, that Messiah, had now come. And no longer were they to be seeking for a coming Messiah, But they were to accept the Messiah that was there. They were to accept that Jesus is the Son of God. Place their faith in Him and no longer live by the letter of the law. But to place their faith in Him. To realize that Jesus had come as a Savior, the Messiah, as a ruler. That He was going to establish a kingdom. And through that kingdom they would be able to restore that relationship with God that had been lost in the garden. When sin entered into the lives of mankind, they were separated from God. But we, through the blood that Jesus shed on the cross, we have the ability to have our sins taken away. We have the honor from that point forward of wearing the name of Christ, of having a special relationship with Christ, a fellowship with with him. Remember Peter said in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus is the savior. He's the only one. Salvation is not found in anyone else. 
But it's up to each one of us to decide, are we going to accept that or not? Are we going to let Jesus be our Savior? Are we going to submit to His will to become a child of God? Folks, we rejoice today because we have a Savior. We rejoice because of Jesus. Next, we rejoice today because Jesus knows our name. The scriptures tell us that our name is written down in heaven. In Luke chapter 10, Luke explains how Jesus sent out 70 disciples, sent them out in pairs, and the purpose of this limited commission was to go out and prepare the cities where Jesus was going to be traveling, to go and to let them know that Jesus was about to be there, that they needed to be ready, be watching for him. Well, they came back to Jesus, and they were rejoicing. But their cause of rejoicing was not what it needed to be. They came back and they were rejoicing because they had the power to cast out demons. That was what they were happy about. That was what was producing this, this joy, this rejoicing in them. But Jesus says, no, that's not what you need to be happy about. No, that's not what needs to produce joy in you. Notice beginning in verse 20. He says, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Think about that. It makes us feel special, doesn't it, whenever we meet someone that we've not seen in a long time and they remember our names. It makes us feel special and important. And there are some people that are wonderful at being able to remember people's names. I'm not. It takes me a while to do that. But there are some people you meet, you meet them one time, see them ten years later, they're going to remember your name. It makes us feel special. It makes us feel warm inside. It, it gives us a, a, a good feeling about that relationship with that person. God knows our name. God knows the name of each and every person that is here today, each and every person that is in this world. God knows us. But I want you also to notice Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5. For in this passage it says, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. And then we skip over a few more chapters to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 15 where it says, And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So from these three passages, we find three things. First, God knows our name. Secondly, we see that our names are written in the book of life. And thirdly, we see that our names can be erased from the book of life. If we do not live a life of faithful service to God and we allow sin to come into our lives, our names can be removed from the book of life. Only those who are faithful to God. When we stand before the judgment seat of Christ and the books are opened, and one of those books being the book of life is there, if our name is not found in that book, it doesn't matter what the other books say. Those other books, it's talking about the New Testament and the Old Testament. The laws that were in establishment when we were alive. If our name is not found in the book of life, these other books don't even have to be considered. Because we're not a child of God. Our name has been removed. But we as children of God should rejoice in the knowledge that God knows our name. God knows who we are. He is in tune to our lives. He sees both the joys and the cares. He knows the struggles. He knows the joys. He is, he, he's there and knows about us. That's really amazing when we think about that. We rejoice that our God knows us. Next, we rejoice because God has revealed his will to us. In Luke chapter 10, after telling his disciples that their name is written in heaven, 
He says in verses 21 and 24, he says, In that hour Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit and said, I thank thee, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent and revealed them to babes. And then skipping down to verse 24, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have not seen it, and to hear what you hear and have not heard it. You know, it's interesting to me that as Jesus is praying here, he prays a prayer of thanksgiving, but what he is thanking God for was that God's will was not revealed to certain people. You ever notice that? Notice what he says. He is rejoicing. He's thanking God that those who are prideful, those who are arrogant, those who would abuse the will of God, he said, those are the ones that your will has not been revealed to. Your will has been revealed to those who will love it, who will honor it, who will share it. Your will has been extended to those who will live by it. He says that there have been people in the past, there have been prophets, there have been kings who wanted to know the will of God, who wanted to know the things that you're able to know. And it wasn't revealed to them. But to you, you're able to know the will of God. I made a statement in a lesson a couple of weeks back about the fact that you and I today as children of God have the ability to know everything that the apostles had the ability to know. And the way that we know that is because God has revealed his will to us. And we are to contend earnestly for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. The Holy Spirit inspired the apostles to lead us into all truth. The way they did that in the first century was through their oral teachings and the way that they propagated that was through the books that have been written. Through the things that we have contained in our word today. And so the very will of God that was revealed to Christ, that was revealed to the apostles in a miraculous way is still revealed to us today by way of God's word. We should rejoice over that fact. We should should rejoice that we have the word of God. We have his will revealed to us. As the book of Psalms tells us, God's word is a light to our path. It is that guide to our life, showing us how we are to live a life that's pleasing to God. Next, we rejoice because God breaks the bounds of Satan. In Luke 13 and verse 10, Jesus is in the synagogue. It's the Sabbath day. And a woman comes in who has been bent over for 18 years. Probably many of us here have had times where we've hurt our back and we've had to walk around stooped over because our backs are in so much pain. Imagine doing that for 18 years can't raise up, can't stretch yourself out, 18 years. The woman comes into the synagogue, Jesus has compassion on her and heals her. Well, the man that's over the synagogue, he gets angry. He's upset. And he begins to tell the people, don't come on the Sabbath day expecting to be healed. If you want to be healed, then you come on another day. Think about the audacity of that statement. But I want you to notice what Jesus said to the crowd, how he responded to this. Notice verses 15 through 17. The Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to be watered? And not not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, meaning being a faithful Jew, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these eighteen years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, but all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. 
What Luke is doing here is picturing Jesus as our compassionate Lord, our compassionate Savior. This incident stresses the compassion of Jesus. But what he does here, he presents a great contrast. Here it was, the Sabbath day. The Jews are saying, we have to keep the letter of the law. The letter of the law says that there are certain things that you are just not supposed to do on the Sabbath day. So if we're going to keep the letter of the law, don't you come here expecting to be healed. Don't come here expecting to do anything but worship God. But then Jesus turned this around. Jesus knew that those Jews cared very deeply for their animals. He knew that in many ways their animals were a tool, something that they used in their trade. If it was not for the care that they gave to their animals, they would suffer in many ways. Now certainly on the Sabbath they were not allowed to go out and to draw water or to carry water, but one thing that they could do is they could go out and they could loosen the binds that are on those animals and they could lead those animals to a place to get water. So Jesus asked the question. He says, if it's okay for you to loose your donkey, for you to loose your cattle, and to lead them to get water on the Sabbath day, then why can we not take this woman who is a faithful Jew, who has been bound by Satan, in fact the text says that it was a demon that caused this, has been bound by Satan for 18 years. He says, why can't we help her? Why can't we loose her from that infirmity that she has? Well, obviously, Jesus' opponents, they were ashamed because they saw the wise reasoning that he was using here. But the crowds, they rejoiced because they were finally seeing the true essence of what our faith is supposed to be. They were finally seeing that it was not about a strict, rigid letter of the law. Now, yes, there were some things that they were not to break. But what they were doing was they were binding where God had loosed. They were binding things. They were making things more strict than they had to be. And the people were finally seeing that this is not the way that it's supposed to be. This is not what God intended. So we rejoice today in the fact that God breaks the binds of Satan. We also rejoice today because God welcomes the penitent. We read in Luke chapter 15 verses 8 through 10 about a woman who lost a coin. And when she found that coin, she went out and she wanted everybody to rejoice with her that she had found that coin. Jesus then follows that story by saying that there is joy among the angels in heaven when a sinner repents of their sins. But then following this, we find the parable of the prodigal son. And we notice in verses 31 through 32, it says, And he, referring to the father of the prodigal son, said to him, talking about the older brother, So son, you are always with me, and all I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. So notice what we see. We see a loving father who knows that his younger son has fallen away and he's there, he's watching, he's waiting. And he runs to meet his son. This was not something that was common in that society. The elders did not run to the younger. The younger people ran to the elders. He runs to meet his son. His love is displayed. He falls upon him. He kisses him, showers him with love, tells him how happy he is that he's come back. That's what God does for us. Have you ever thought about that? When we fall away into sin, and as the parable of the prodigal son says, he came to himself, when we come to ourselves, when we come to our senses, when we realize that we're not doing right and we come back to God and we're repentant, we ask God to forgive us, 
But what does he do? He showers us with love. He forgives us of our sins. He welcomes us back into the fellowship of his family. If that's not a reason for rejoicing, I don't know what is. We rejoice because we have a loving, forgiving Heavenly Father who is willing to forgive our sins if we're willing to repent. And it may be this morning that there is someone sitting here today that has strayed from the faith. That you've turned away from God. You've gone back out into the world. You've been living a life of sin. The Father is waiting with open arms to welcome you back. But not only is your heavenly Father waiting on you to come back. The angels in heaven are going to rejoice. The blood of Jesus is going to be there to forgive your sins. And each and every person in this place today will rejoice with you. And the reason why we're able to rejoice is because at one point we were in the same boat. At one time we were all lost. But we rejoice today that our sins have been washed away and we want to rejoice with you. We want to help you in getting your life right with God. And so if you're here today and you're not a child of God, then we would encourage you to place your faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, to accept the Word of God as the inspired Word, to come forward, confess that you believe that Jesus is God's Son. Submit yourself to the waters of baptism. You'll come into contact with the blood of Christ. Your sins will be washed away. And just as we see in the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch, you'll be able to go on your way rejoicing. You will have that true joy in your life that can only be found by having a relationship with Christ Jesus, by being a child of God. Or it may be that there's someone here who is a Christian, but you have strayed from the faith. You've allowed sin to come in and separate you from God then come forward and make that known. Repent of your sins. Be restored back to the faith. Remember the picture of the father of the prodigal son waiting with open arms. That's what God is doing today. Waiting to welcome you back. To forgive your sins. To restore you to faithful service. To give you that cause for rejoicing. This morning, if you examine yourself, you need to respond to the Lord's invitation. We encourage you to come at this time while together we stand and sing.